Greetings. You are about to listen to Sandor Elix Katz speaking on Monday, January 28th, 2013 at the UC Santa Cruz Kresge Town Hall. The talk was hosted by the Common Ground Center, Education for a Just and Sustainable World. For more information, please visit us on the web at kresge.ucsc.edu slash common ground. This is good. I think we're I think we're good. Um, so this is this is really an awesome crowd. Um, um, you know, it, this is such a great crowd. It makes me nervous. <laughs> um, so okay, first I just want to see a show of hands, and I want to know how many of you are practicing some kind of fermentation, uh, you know, in your homes these days. <laughs> Okay, well that 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 is amazing, and um, and uh, you know Santa Cruz uh, uh, you know has really uh, uh, stood out in my awareness for for a long time as a place where um, you know a lot of people are are, are fermenting. There's a lot of support for um, uh, small local fermentation businesses, and uh, I'm very excited to be here uh, uh, talking about fermentation. So I'm going to really try to keep my uh, my 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 remarks relatively brief, mostly, I mean, not so we can get out of here, but like so that we can have more interactive um, um, and, uh, you know, hear, hear from you all and um, uh, answer questions and whatever. And I feel really um, humbled being uh, 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 in front of all these other faces of people who have spoken here uh, uh, in the past. Um, so what I want to do, you know, most of the public speaking I do is teaching people how to make sauerkraut. And that's not really that practical in a large group. And it seems like most of you already know how to do that. Um, so what, 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 what I'm going to do today is, is really talk about um, uh, fermentation as it relates to some larger themes. Um, uh, Coevolution, culture, and community. Um, so we'll start with coevolution, e evolution. You know, the, the emerging consensus among uh, evolutionary biologists is that all life is evolved from bacteria. Um, and the, the corollary to this, which doesn't get talked about quite as much, is that no other form of life has ever lived without bacteria. Um, so, you know, even though all of us in the United States um, and, and, and much of the rest of the world, um, you know, get indoctrinated into an ideology that I would describe as the war on bacteria, you know, the idea that bacteria are scary, bacteria are dangerous, we should try to kill all the bacteria, and, uh, you know, our lives would be better if we could somehow eradicate all bacteria. You know, even though we all get indoctrinated with these ideas, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, you know, in the last couple of years especially, there has just been, you know, a huge amount of new information, um, uh, you know, demonstrating how dependent we are on bacteria in our bodies. Um, so... You know, first of all, the, 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 the biologists who count cells tell us that the cells of our bodies, the cells that we each have that, um, you know, reflect our own unique individual DNA code, are outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria that we are host to. You know, or maybe it is they who are host to us. Um, but, um, but, but, but in any case, you know, there are more bacterial cells in our bodies than bodily cells, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that are of our, of our DNA. And, you know, these, these bacteria that are part of us are not, um, I mean, they're not like parasites. They're not out for a free ride. They give us a lot of our functionality. Human beings could not... Um, uh, uh, survive or function without bacteria. I mean, just starting at the beginning, human beings cannot reproduce without lactic acid bacteria. And in fact, women's bodies produce a glycogen, a carbohydrate that specifically supports um, a population of lactic acid bacteria that create an acidic environment that facilitates human reproduction. Um, and then, um, you know, we couldn't effectively digest our food without bacteria. 
You know, the reason babies can't eat solid food has less to do with the fact that they don't have teeth than it has to do with the fact that they don't have the bacteria that enable them to digest their food. So bacteria enable us to digest food and assimilate nutrients. Uh, bacteria synthesize certain essential nutrients for us. Um, and it's becoming increasingly clear that what we call our immune function, um, you know, that we rely on to protect us from bacteria, is regulated by bacteria. Um, so, so, you know, in 2012, this research was published that demonstrated that when you have, uh, uh, when you have um, bronchitis, a bacterial infection in your lung, and your body mounts an immune response, which amounts to, um, uh, you know, mobilizing what white blood cells and sending them to surround and isolate that infe infection and then effectively digest it away, that response is mediated by bacteria in our gut. The other you know, really exciting new frontier of um, you know, bacterial functionality that, 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 that uh, um, sort of has, has um, emerged just in the last year is the idea that um, serotonin, you know, that, 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 that compound in our bodies that regulates you know, our brain, how we think, how we feel, um, uh, that, that, that the release of serotonin is mediated by gut bacteria. So all these varied aspects of, of our functioning are dependent on bacteria. Um, and you know, we are evolved from bacteria and, um, and, and, and they are part of us. Um, now plants are no less um, dependent on bacteria than we are. And, um, and you know, the, the bacteria on plants are not completely random. Um, you know, there are, broad, uh, there are broad patterns of what kinds of bacteria you find on, on plants. And so, you know, the, the, the entire long, you know, sort of co-evolutionary history of, of human beings and the plants that we have cultivated and, you know, sort of created through the millennia, through selection, the relationships we have are not just with the plants, you know, and, and with the animals that we've domesticated as well, but with, you know, these, um, uh, with these macroorganisms and the microorganisms that are on them. Um, and so, you know, as, you know from, from, the, from the very beginnings of, of, of agriculture, you know, as soon as people, as, as soon as people began, um, 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 you know, thinking beyond the food that they're, that's going to get them through that day. I mean, you know, hunter-gatherers don't have to think too much about the, the, the dynamics of how food ages over time. You know, and if you want to spend, um, you know, every day procuring the food resources to get you through that day, you don't have to be too concerned about that. But, you know, in order to start investing our energy into crops that are ready at certain moments of the year, like for that to be meaningful, for us to be able to um, uh, survive based on that, you know, we need to have some insights into how food, um, um, you know, ages under different kinds of storage uh, conditions. So, you know, really millennia before, you know, Louis Pasteur looked under a microscope and began to identify specific, um, you know, bacteria and, 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 uh, and, and yeasts, you know, human beings had, had a really clear understanding of, um, you know, how um, uh, food, uh, you know, aged under different kinds of storage conditions, the dynamics of, of fermentation. And really what every ferment uh, amounts to is a manipulation of environmental conditions to encourage the growth of certain types of organisms while simultaneously discouraging the, group, the, the, the growth of other uh, types of of, of, of organisms. So, um, you know, so these microorganisms are, they're, they're just part of the context of our food. And, uh, you know, and there's no escaping uh, them. Um, you know, I mean, not all microbial transformation turns food into, uh, you know, uh, uh, wonderful delicacies. Um, you know, most of the food that we discard, we're discarding because of the microorganisms growing on the food. You know, when food spoils or becomes rotten, that, that's because of the growth of microorganisms. But we never call these things um, fermented. You know, fermented implies a certain amount of intentionality. At the beginning, when I asked, like, how many people were fermenting things in their homes, you know, some, someone over in that, that area said, do you mean intentionally? But, you know, when you say ferment, you always mean intentionally because, you know, just random, um, uh, spontaneous microbial transformations, you know, 
people typically reject as rotten or spoiled. And, and uh, you know, frequently the question comes up, you know, what is, the, what is the boundary between what is fermented and what is rotten? And there is no objective scientific answer to that question. Um, you know, that is cultural subjectivity. Um, you know, that, that, that is, you know, what you can tolerate, what you can stomach. And, you know, if we think of, uh, um, you know, if, if we think of two poles of, you know, fresh and rotten, and, you know, from the time you're a tiny child, you begin learning that distinction, you know, not to put things that are rotten into your, in, in, into your mouth. So, so these represent, you know, sort of the two, two poles. But, you know, how is it that, you know, all of the greatest delicacies that people around the world, um, you know, love, they're neither fresh nor rotten, but they exist, you know, somewhere in that, you know, creative space between fresh, fresh or rotten, where, you know, people have figured out how to manipulate environmental conditions to get organisms to grow on the food that turn it into something that is stable and delicious. Um, and, uh, you know, you can walk into any gourmet food store uh, and look around and think about the nature of the foods that we elevate on this pedestal. And, you know, all of them are products of fermentation. Fermentation creates strong flavors, but they're not always flavors that everyone can agree on. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll do a little poll about stinky cheeses. Okay, who here could identify with the statement, like, I love stinky cheeses, and the further away I can smell them, the more I like them? Okay, so we are, we are a minority in this room. Um, so not everybody can agree on every, you know, flavor of fermentation. And really, like, you know, for those of us who love stinky cheeses, you know, if we go to the fancy cheese store and invest in a chunk of cheese and, you know, invite some of our friends over, you know, a lot of our friends will show up and they'll open the door and their first question will be, what died in here? Um, and they would never for a minute think about putting it into their mouth. So, you know, so these things, you know, fermented foods in general would, would, would you know, you could describe them as acquired tastes. I mean, they're for the most part not tastes that we are, we are born um, uh, loving. Um, so, you know, if we think about, you know, coexistence with microorganisms as being a biological imperative, then, you know, we could say that, you know, fermented foods and beverages are, are, are human cultural manifestations of this, um, you know, of, the, of this biological um, uh, imperative. And so, okay, that leads us to, to the next theme, which is uh, culture. And, uh, you know, the word culture, it's a complicated word with, with, uh, with many layers of meaning. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, really, the way I, I the way I, I got in, interested in, th I started thinking about this theme was, you know, when you when you make yogurt, what, what we call the little communities of bacteria that we introduce into the milk to make yogurt are cultures. That's that's the yogurt culture, and it's a word that we use to describe, you know, any kinds of organisms that we might introduce into our foods. Those are cultures. The act of introducing them is culturing. And then we call the products cultured foods. So, you know, how is it that we use the same word to describe both these little communities of microorganisms that we introduce into our foods in order to ferment them, uh, and also use the same word to describe, um, uh, you know, language, literature, scientific knowledge, religious belief systems and practices, and, and, you know, really the totality of all things that people seek to pass down from generation to generation. Um, so, you know, if we, if we sort of, you know, peel away the word, the, you know, the, 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 the root of the word um, culture comes from cultivation. Um, and so, you know, agriculture, um, uh, you know, um, I'm cultivating the soil um, and, uh, and, you know, the seeds that we pass down, the techniques for working the soil that we, that we pass down. But, you know, our, our sense of what we could cultivate has grown over time. Um, and, um, you know, in, in the age of microbiology, you know, in a laboratory with test tubes and petri dishes and things like that, you know, people are culturing cells. Um, and so, so that's the relationship. But it has to do with agriculture. 
And, um, you know, as, 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 as I said at the beginning, I mean, I think that, you know, agriculture would not make sense without fermentation. If we didn't have some insights into, you know, how we could effectively, uh, uh, you know, store the harvest to feed us through the rest of the year, there's no way that people could invest their energy, um, you know, into growing, growing these crops that are ready at certain moments of the year. Um, fermented foods, you know, as a group, you know, are, are more than incidental culinary novelties. You know, they're very tied up in, in people's sense of, uh, of cultural identity. A woman I've become friendly with, uh, Betty Steckmeyer from Fort Bragg, uh, um, uh, California, um, uh, she ran for 35 years a business called Gem Cultures, and she's retired from that, but her, her daughter's running the business now. But, but one of the cultures that Betty sold um, was for uh, uh, Vili, which is a Finnish milk culture. I mean, it's a great, weird culture. It makes this sort of gluey, viscous, fermented milk. There's got, you know, beautiful, mild flavor, but this, like, you know, crazy um, uh, uh, texture. Um, but, but anyway, the way she got Vili, she, she married into this Finnish family, uh, and, um, uh, and her, her husband's uncle... Um, uh, had come over from Finland as a child, and his family had brought the Vili with them. Um, and uh, so, you know, as, as Betty got interested in all this, you know, she sort of took the Vili and really propagated it and spread it all around the United States um, uh, and was very committed to its propagation. She tells this beautiful story of when she was caretaking for her husband's uncle when he was 96 years old and at the very end of his life. And, uh, you know, one day this old man, um, you know, sat up in bed abruptly and called Betty into the room. And, uh, and he said, you know how to take care of the culture. And she was like, yes, Van, I've been propagating it for 35 years. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very committed to it. Um, uh, you know, I know how to take good care of it. You don't have to worry about that. The next time she went into the room, he was dead. Um, and it was really, you know, for, as she told the story, it, like that was his dying concern. That was, that was the embodiment of the world that he had left behind 90 years earlier. Um, and he needed her, uh, you know, assurance that, that, that the culture would continue, that, 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 that you know, it was not going to end with his life. And, um, you know, I mean... Uh, uh, you know, this is one story, but like when you hear migration stories from you know anyone who had the ability to bring their most precious possessions with them on their migration journey, people always brought their fermentation cultures. People always brought their sourdoughs, their yogurt cultures, um, uh, whatever whatever it is. Uh, a couple months ago, I met this uh, Indonesian family in Sonoma County who you know came over with their tempeh cultures. Um, you know, whatever the culture is, you know, people, if they, if they have the possibility of bringing it, um, uh, they do. Um, you know, if you look around at, um, you know, at, at, uh, I mean, f f fermentation has had a huge role in, um, you know, religious iconography and ritual. And, um, you know, at, at, at every level, you know, you can look at, um, you know, the, the major world religions that, that, that do not ban alcohol, treat it as a sacrament. Um, so, you know, it's not some random substance that transubstantiates into the blood of Jesus Christ, is it? It's, it's wine. It's a product of fermentation. Um, in, the, in the Jewish tradition that I grew up in, you know, we, 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 drink, we drink toasts and say a prayer, uh, you know, repeatedly. Uh, you know, blessed is the creator of the fruit of the vine. Bore pari hagafet. And then, you know, we, then we drink some wine. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a sacrament. Uh, you know, if you look around the world at, you know, at, at, at indigenous cultures, like there's a huge amount of ritual around fermentation and fermented products. Um, you know, people have recognized fermentation as, um, you know, as, 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 as godly, as, um, uh, you know, as, as, as sacred and certainly as integral to their, to their cultural uh, uh, practices, you know. Um, you know, fer fermented foods are, you know, I, I guess I just said this, like they're not incidental culinary novelties. You know, they're not like cupcakes. You know, they're, 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 they're something which is, um, uh, you know, just, just centrally important to people's sense of identity. Um, you know, and, and also it's not, uh, I mean, fermentation is, 
I mean, everybody eats fermented foods every day. You know, I meet people sometimes who say, who, you know, they hear what I do and they're like, oh, I hate fermented foods, you know, and I think, you know, they're, they think that I'm talking about, you know, about stinky cheeses or sauerkraut or something like that. But like, everybody eats fermented foods every day. You'd have very little left to eat if you didn't eat anything fermented. Um, so, you know, in the, in the standard American diet kind of a context, um, you know, there's bread, there's cheese, um, um, there is condiments, all the condiments we put on our food. You know, I mean, they're the ones that are directly fermented, like, you know, fish sauce and soy sauce and certain hot sauces. But the ones that aren't directly fermented, what do they have in them to stabilize them? What do, what do ketchup, mayonnaise, and mustard all have in common? Vinegar. So vinegar is, is, is a product of fermentation. So, you know, once, once you, you know, once you really look at the ingredients of food, you know, fermented foods are in almost everything. Um, it would be very difficult to not eat them um, 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 at all. Um, you know, another, another aspect of, you know, fermented foods and culture is some of the technology that fermentation has, um, has spawned. I mean, it's, it's all technology that, that we take for granted. Ceramic vessels, for instance. Um, you know, what's the incentive for people to, you know, figure out how to make vessels? It's to have something to ferment in. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, we don't know anything about the origins of, 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 of any fermented food. Really, I mean, some fermented foods are, are, are latter-day fermented foods. Rejuvelac, like I could tell you, you know, who invented rejuvelac. Um, uh, but you know, the, 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 the classic fermented foods, they all predate recorded history and, um, you know, and many of the oldest surviving documents in different language traditions, uh, you know, refer to ferments that already existed in those parts of the world at the time those documents were written, like the Sumerian texts, uh, the Sumerian tablets, which have actually, you know, recipes for beer and for, and, 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 and for bread. Um, but there's a huge amount of speculative literature about, you know, how did people, you know, how did people discover or invent alcohol? And, well, I mean, certainly people didn't invent it. Um, um, you know, I, I don't even think you could say that people discovered it. I mean, uh, you know, alcohol is a natural phenomenon. It's a, it's a smell and a flavor that all sorts of, you know, insects and birds and animals are drawn to. Um, and there's lots of documentation of animals that are drawn to the smell and the flavor of fermenting fruit, um, gorging themselves, um, and even becoming inebriated, disoriented. Um, so it's very easy to imagine our primate ancestors, um, you know, following the smell, um, uh, you know, filling their mouths with berries, gorging themselves, and experiencing the fleeting sensations of inebriation. So. I mean, you can't say that humans discovered alcohol. I mean, you know, what, what, you know, the, the, the human cultural innovation was, you know, figuring out how to make it. And in order to make an alcoholic beverage, you need a vessel to put it in. So, you know, like Claude Levi-Strauss, a cultural theorist of the 20th century, you know, his, his, the, the, the object that he talked about a lot was a hollowed out tree. And he calls that the, the transitional object from nature to culture. Um, because in that hollowed out tree, that's, that's a vessel that you can put liquid in. You could put honey in there and dilute it with water. And so once you have a vessel, you have the possibility of creating the conditions to make an alcoholic beverage. And, uh, you know, of course, the techniques have been refined over time. The vessels have been refined. You know, now we have little airlocks. You know, if you believe the, you know, the, the contemporary hobby literature, you couldn't make an alcoholic beverage without a little plastic airlock. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't mean to dismiss this you know, airlocks, they're, they're, they're great and they definitely facilitate making stronger beverages that aren't vinegary, but, you know, people have been doing this for 10,000 years before they had little plastic airlocks. Um, um, you know, I mean, in my own, uh, when I got interested in fermentation and I started reading the, the, the hobbyist literature of beer and winemaking, uh, you know, I, I experimented with it, but it, it, there was this one thing that didn't make sense to me, and that is that um, in, in 1985, which is when I graduated from college, a, a friend and I went on this uh, you know, amazing journey traveling overland across the Sahara Desert and into, into West Africa. And you know, once we were through the desert, once we got into sort of the you know, lusher part of Africa, every little village we went to, we were greeted by 
alcoholic beverage, you know, um, palm wine, uh, millet beer, different kinds of fruit wines. And, you know, usually they were out of open vessels. So when I started reading this, like, hobby literature, and it said you needed, you know, potassium metabisulfate, and, you know, you needed a carboy and an airlock, it just was like, how, how are these people making these beverages? You know, I wasn't really specifically thinking about fermentation, uh, 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 you know, that, that long ago, but it was just this big conundrum for me. You know, how could it be that these people who didn't have, put, who I imagine didn't have potassium metabisulfate tablets or, you know, little plastic airlocks or a store to go to where they could, you know, get the right variety of yeast, you know, how is it that they were making alcoholic beverages? And um, so anyway, you know, that, that's one of the things that sort of, you know, led me to the idea of just, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out really simple, straightforward, empowering methods that, like, you know, anybody could do without a lot of special equipment. And, you know, obviously when you get into these things, you know, sometimes it makes sense to get some specialized equipment. I mean, I'm certainly not against specialized equipment, but, you know, my interest is demonstrating to people how, you know, utterly simple these processes are in their, in their um, uh, uh, you know, mo most, most basic form. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to just talk a little bit about 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 community. So, um, you know, I, I'm I think that fermentation relates to community in a number of different ways. But first, I'm going to talk about microbial communities. So, um, you know, the idea of going to the store and buying a packet of yeast that's very that's like a that's a it, 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 the idea of singular yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or a single type of bacterium, um, you know, Lactobacillus plantarum. Um, you know, this is like very much a human contrivance of the last 150 years of the age of microbiology. In the natural world, on the foods that we are fermenting, microorganisms exist in communities. The whole thrust of, um, uh, you know, fermentation in the age of microbiology has been sort of, you know, getting rid of the broad microbial communities and any microorganism not deemed to be utterly essential and to just pick out the ones that are um, uh, considered to be essential. Um, so, for instance, um, yogurt. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, traditional yogurt, which is, you know, varied in different places. You know, yogurt is not a singular thing. You know, yogurt is, 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 is something that is, you know, it's like a little bit different in Bar Bulgaria than it is in Greece, a little bit different there than it is in Turkey. And, e you know, each place in the, in the yogurt region, um, you know, has, has slightly different microbial communities in their yogurt. But, um, you know, when, when, when the Pasteur Institute uh, uh, got interested in yogurt at the beginning of the 20th century, they went to Bulgaria, they got some samples of yogurt, they looked under the microscope at this broad community, and, um, and they, they basically decided that out of the broad community, two bacteria were the essential ones. So, so yogurt is defined by law in the United States uh, for international trade by the Codex Alimentarius, as being a ferment based on, uh, on, on two specific bacteria. One of them is Lactobacillus bulgaricus. The other one is uh, Streptococcus thermophilus. You, you never see Streptococcus thermophilus spelled out on a yogurt container, because um, uh, that would be bad press. Um, <laughs> But, um, but, but anyway, um, you know, and then sometimes we'll have a third or a fourth kind of um, a, 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 a culture added into that. But, um, okay, how many people here have ever made yogurt? Okay, like it's a thing, like lots of people, lots of people do. So if you go to the store and you just buy a container of plain yogurt that's commercially available, um, uh, you know, doesn't really matter what, what brand you use, you can make yogurt. And then if you take the yogurt you made and try to make another batch of yogurt, maybe you can make yogurt. Probably won't be quite as thick as the first batch you did. Then when you do like your next generation, it, it, it's, it's less thick, it's less like yogurt. And by the time you do five or six generations, it's not yogurt. Has anyone else had an experience like this? So, yeah, I mean, it's really, um, it was dispiriting for me, and, I, and, 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 and it also was just confusing, because, you know, how could this food have been perpetuated through the generations if I couldn't even get, you know, five generations out of it? I had to go back to the store and buy another container of yogurt to start it. So, so you know, it was just a big, it was a big mystery to me. Um, 
And then a few years ago, I got a hold of an heirloom yogurt culture. I actually got a hold of two of them. One was a Bulgarian culture, one was a Greek culture. Um, and uh, uh, the Greek one, I accidentally ate the last of it, so now I only have the Bulgarian one. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's been like something, I haven't been counting, but you know, I do it every couple of weeks. So you know, it's probably like 60 generations old at this point, and every batch is just as nice and thick and tangy as the last batch. So, so the thing is that, so, so all of these evolved bacterial communities that turn into foods that people perpetuate, the communities evolve with a structure, and the structure enables them to maintain the integrity of the community of bacteria. When you, when, when you just sort of isolate out two, bacterium out of, two bacteria out of that, it's like an arranged marriage, you know. It's just not, you know. It's it, it's not it's not a sort of you know um, uh, you know evolved you know organic relationship that has a structure which can maintain itself. Um, and so so it's sort of you know in, in inherently um, uh, you know not able to perpetuate itself. And what it does is it introduces. I mean I, I mean I have to assume there must be some benefit. For a large, you know, for a mass producer of yogurt, otherwise they never would have been able to sort of, you know, sell people on the concept. And incidentally, the, you know, the first company in the world that used, um, uh, you know, one of these, um, uh, um, you know, improved yogurt cultures was Danin in 1919 when they started in Barcelona. Um, uh, but uh, so I mean, I have to assume that there's some benefit for mass production. But for anyone doing it on a household scale, it, it is just it is purely disempowering because you have to keep on going back and buying another one. And to me, this story is exactly analogous to um, to what happened uh, uh, with seeds. So you know, if, if seeds are something which farmers and gardeners have always just it's just been part of gardening is perpetuating the seeds that you're using. And then, you know, during the 20th century, plant breeders, you know, had the idea of creating hybrids and sold everyone on the idea of improved yields. And, and, and really, like, if you create ideal conditions, the, the yields can be improved from hybrid seeds. But the problem is that ideal conditions don't really exist. And so, you know, in order to, to get the benefit of the hybrid seeds, you know, we needed chemicals to kill the pests. We needed irrigation systems to give them enough water. And it's really just created this huge amount of dependency. And we have to go, and we, and you can't save your own seeds. You have to go back to the plant, plant breeder every year to get, you know, like, you know, new seeds that 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 that, that are line A and line B, to, so you can have your your hybrid vigor. So, um, uh, so, 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 so anyway, you know, microorganisms exist in communities, and they are most stable as communities. Another great example of this is is tempeh. So you know the tempeh that's, that's that's commercially available in the United States is is a single um, uh, 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 species of mold. It's Rhizopus oligosporus. Um, traditional tempeh is a mixed community with several different kinds of molds as well as bacteria. In order to propagate a single um, uh, 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 you know fungal species takes a, a very controlled environment. Um, you know, you need to pressure cook your substrate so that there's no other kind of organism surviving on it. Um, you know, you need to, you, you need to sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, have you know some sort of a, a sterile environment to get the, the 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 culture that you're trying to get in there you know onto your sterilized sub substrate you know it's very technically demanding it's, it's, I would say that it is the most technically demanding um, you know ferment that I have ever done is trying to propagate single single spore molds like that. Last winter I got a chance to go to Indonesia and I went to a village where they were producing tempeh and. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I asked to see, well, the, 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 the culture that they used was on a leaf. It was just some mold growing on a leaf. And, and the guy, you know, he had uh, um, uh, 50 kilos of, of, of soybeans and one leaf in his hand, and he just, like, picked up the beans and went like this. Uh, and then I asked him to, like, show me the, sh show me the leaves. And he, like, pulls out a shoebox and they're just in a cardboard box, like, you know, a hundred leaves in there. And then he went outside of the house and, and 
took some leaves off of this tree. It's called a waru tree. It's a, it's a kind of a hibiscus family tree. And he just took a couple of the uh, 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 beans that were already inoculated and put them on that leaf and made a little sandwich and, he, and just left it with the tempeh to, to ripen. And he was going to leave it for, for three days or four days until, you, until it sporulated. But you know the point is that for something to have been perpetuated over the course of generations, it just needs to be easy to do. It needs to be accessible for people to do at the household level. And, um, and you know, the, the supposed improvements that microbiology has brought to these things has, has largely disempowered people um, and really just made them, um, uh, you know, made these processes more complicated than they need to be. And in a sense, feed into the fear. Um, you know, because of the war on bacteria, you know, Many people are just terrified of something, let's say, as simple as sauerkraut. So, you know, the number one question that I have fielded through the years is, how can I be sure I have good bacteria and not bad bacteria growing? Um, and at least in the realm of sauerkraut, you know, this really, I mean, it's, it, it's an unwarranted fear. Um, I've gotten to be friendly with this uh, uh, microbiologist for the USDA, uh, who's part of the Agricultural Research Service. He works at North Carolina State University. He is, you know, the, 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 the government's top, you know, expert in vegetable fermentation. And, uh, you know, and he has written and, uh, you know, and told me in conversations that there has never been a single documented case of food poisoning in the United States from fermented vegetables. So, you know, just because just because we've been brainwashed to think bacteria are dangerous, you know, everyone like assumes that, 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 that fermentations are dangerous. But in fact, you know, fermentations have been passed down through so many generations precisely because they are so safe. They are such reliable ways of effectively storing food and they are not Russian roulette. Um, so, okay, so that's one aspect of, 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 of community is that, you know, microorganisms exist uh, in communities. But then, you know, I mean, remember, like, food is a community activity, right? I mean, you know, I mean, we have this, like, myth of self-sufficiency and, you know, this idea of, like, you know, the, like, a, you know, some family homestead where, you know, people are making everything they need for themselves. But, you know, that, that, that's really a myth. It's just not possible. You know, if you think it takes a village to raise a child, I mean, it, raise, it takes a village to you know, to, to, to feed people. Um, and so, you know, every aspect of, of, of food involves community. You know, growing food takes people, um, uh, takes lots of different people. You know, what brings people together better than food? I mean, you know, when, when people come together, when, when families come together, um, uh, you know, when, when, when neighbors come together, I mean, it's always, it's always around food. Um, you know, and, and thinking about fermentation, I mean, you know, certainly like, you know, my, my interest is empowering people and, and helping people realize they can make these things themselves. But I mean, I don't really think it's realistic for anybody to, you know, make their own, you know, beer and soy sauce and tempeh and sauerkraut. I mean, you know, it makes sense to have a little bit of specialization and then you can trade with your neighbors and your friends. And, and so, you know, it, to have a well-rounded diet, it takes a village. Um, so, um, So yeah, so uh, you know, so food brings t people together in, in, in communities. Um, you know, I think that uh, I mean the, the 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 time in which I grew up, we had you know pretty much given up on the idea of you know local food, regional food self sufficiency. You know, we'd really bought into the idea that centralized food production was most efficient and um, and, and really you know had liberated us. Um, you know, I think I think in 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 more recent years, people are waking up to the fact that there are, um, you know, that that there are uh, uh, costs to being so disconnected to our food, um, um, and you know, those costs are are partly you know declining health, partly it is environmental destruction. I mean, you know, the the the, the technology that has allowed for you know this centralized mass production of food is really very destructive technology um, that is you know destroying land, depleting water resources, creating all sorts of pollution, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, very uh, uh, um, uh, fuel dependent. 
um, uh, you know, all, all these things. So, I mean, I think that, you know, for ferment, ferments, but for food more broadly, it's just critically important that, that, that we be reclaiming our food. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and that is for so many different reasons. It's reclaiming food, you know, so we can eat good food and be healthy. It's reclaiming food so that we can have healthy soil and, and, and try to build a, a better world rather than just keeping on, um, uh, you know, spiraling downward. It's also about economics. Um, you know, food is a way of creating jobs and, um, um, you know, and, 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 and building local economies and, and, and circulating wealth locally. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, I would say that, you know, fer fermentation really fits into this sort of local food revival and the, the social movements uh, uh, trying to reclaim our food. Um, and finally, I just want to talk about other connotations of the word fermentation. The word fermentation comes from Latin fervere, which means to boil. And actually, the word yeast comes from Greek zestos, which means the same thing, to boil. Uh, and it's because um, you know, the, the visible action of fermentation is the same as the visible action of boiling. So linguistically, the two concepts got you know, kind, of, kind of intertwined. But then we also use this other connotation of fermentation. And people talk about the social ferment, um, cultural ferment, political ferment, intellectual ferment. I, I even saw a, a reference to uh, spiritual ferment. Um, and what, what, what this has to do with is like a metaphor of bubbling. It's like when people get bubbly, when you get excited about something, you know, you can't shut up about it, right? You're talking about it. You want to, you want to share it with everyone. You want to tell everyone about it. And, and so, you know, in this sense, um, you know, fermentation is, you know, it is the engine of social change. You know, things can't change if people aren't, you know, animated by ideas and, and, and excited about them. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that's change about our food, but it's also change, you know, related to every other aspect um, of our lives. So with that thought, I am going to shut my mouth and, um, and, uh, and see if, uh, if y'all have any questions. And they, they're really, you know, they can be about, you know, big, broad questions like I've been talking about, or they can be about the mold on your sauerkraut or the lack of bubbles in your mead or, or anything. And, and just, you just need to project. I mean, sure. I mean, I, I mean, there's a lot of contemporary meat uh, 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 fermentation. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know too much about, you know, uh, about that, that, you know, about that story, and um, you know what the, you know, I mean, a few things, you know, might might happen. You know, it probably gets dehydrated a little bit. It probably gets a little bit salty from the sweat of the animal. Um, but you know, most of the fermented meat products that are in contemporary use involve those two things: salt and dehydration. So you know the, the 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 meat that is you know kind of universally regarded as fermented are salamis. Those are always referred to as fermented uh, sausages. Um, uh, and the fermentation, the, the acidification of fermentation is an essential part of what enables salamis to safely be preserved. Hands and, um, uh, and and things like that. Fermentation occurs, but it is generally regarded as more incidental. It uh, you know it contributes flavor, but it, but 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 the but the preservation is less about acidification and more about drying and salting. What is what? What's the bacteria? Generally, lactic acid bacteria. But here's an interesting thing about the bacteria in salami. The first experiments with culturing salami were done in 1961, 51 years ago. Um, um, 
you know, it was always based upon wild fermentation, the, 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 the microorganisms that were spontaneously present. Now, wild fermentation of meat is, is kind of an interesting thing, you know, compare, you know, vegetables, like, there are lactic acid bacteria, with this one in particular, Leuconostoc mesorantoides, which is generally regarded as the, the, the bacteria that, that, that initiates the sauerkraut fermentation, is found on all land plants. Meat, interior flesh is sterile, so it's a little bit random what kind of bacteria it gets on it. You know, some people think that it's actually, that, 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 the, that, that in traditional salami making, it was the bacteria on people's hands mixing the meat that, uh, 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 that, that, that got it. Uh, they, they got it on there. It, all, almost all of the commercial salami available in the United States is made by culturing with lactic acid bacteria. Um, uh, and hardly any of the salami made in Europe is made with culturing. Uh, like it, no, no, no. There, there's, there's different kinds. No, there, there's not a single. There's, there's not a single bacterium. Um, you know, there, there's, there's different starters you, you could buy. Um, uh, but this one, th this one salami maker in New York, whose family had, had, had been in the salami business for at least 100 years in New York and, and, and had come from Italy before that, um, uh, convinced the FDA to, to let them continue making um, uh, salami in their traditional way. And the experiment they did was fascinating. They, they, you know, with the help of a microbiologist, they specifically injected salmonella and E. coli 0157 into some salamis and then aged them and then sent them to the FDA for testing and they couldn't find the, 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 the pathogens in there. So, you know, basically what they did is they demonstrated that, um, uh, you know, the, you know, during the aging process, um, you know, with the, uh, uh, you know, sort of bacteria that was just from, from mixing the meat, um, were able to um, destroy the, um, the introduced pathogens. And this is, the, this is also the reason why sauerkraut is more safe than, for, than raw vegetables, right? Like, you know, every year we hear about people getting sick from, you know, lettuce, uh, spinach, tomatoes, you know, one thing after another. And, and so, you know, I mean, obviously contamination is possible. You know, in those cases, usually it's, you know, manure from a factory farm uphill, runs, runs over the vegetable field. Um, you know, it could just as well happen in handling. Wouldn't, what's that? Listeria, but it's also, it's also, you know, these, it could be these, these, these other things. But any of these things, if they were, if they were on vegetables, um, uh, first of all, the indigenous population of lactic acid bacteria would always dominate, and as they acidify the environment, they would destroy the, 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 the pathogens. Um, so acidification is definitely a strategy for safety. Um, uh, just one other thing about fermented meat. Um, uh, because meat has so, uh, uh, has so little carbohydrate content, and it is carbohydrates that turn into acids, um, typically you add some sugar. And, and the sugar is what enables it to acidify enough. And that's why you get more pronounced acidification of salami, where you can mix something up with the meat compared to, um, uh, you know, uh, hams or other kinds of whole cuts where, you know, there's no way of getting, you know, getting that, that kind of thing evenly distributed. A lot of the fish fermentation processes that are in use around Asia, they introduce rice. So sushi, what we know as the, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, just raw, fresh fish, how did they eat sushi before, before refrigeration? Sushi was historically a ferment, a ferment of uh, a fish with rice, and and you know many places all across Asia, people pe people um, you know eat fish that's been fermented with rice, and the rice provides the carbohydrates that allow for the acidification that that can safely and effectively preserve the fish.
Yeah, sure. Okay, so let me first of all say I have very little experience with um, uh, you know working with uh, you know di di different kinds of yeast. I mean, they're they're the, the, what you described. They're both Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They're the same species, but within Saccharomyces cerevisiae, many different strains have been selected for different um, for for different qualities. So, I mean, active dry yeast is generally used for bread baking, but, you, but, but, but it also it makes alcohol, and, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's the same yeast. So it's just a question of what it's been selected for. Um, and, I, and I don't know too much about the fine distinctions between different ones. Now, in terms of wild yeast, it's on the apples. So if you have fresh apple cider, it starts bubbling within hours, like when you press apples, they, they, they just start to bubble. Um, you know, definitely I would say the first alcohol that I was ever uh, uh, exposed to as a child was, um, uh, you know, be, before they started pasteurizing apple cider, um, you know, we would buy these like plastic gallon sized things of cider um, uh, and, uh, and it would start to pressurize in, in the fridge and we'd open it up and it would be fizzy. My sister and I used to call it fuzzy cider. Um, and, uh, but I mean, it really just happens spontaneously. So that's how, you know, that, that's how, you know, hard cider traditionally has been made. You just like, you don't, don't do anything. You, you just, um, uh, you know, you, 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 you shred the apples and, 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 and press them and the juice comes out and all the juice, uh, uh, you know, runs over the skins uh, that have yeast on them, and then it, ju it just starts. Same with um, uh, uh, same with wine. You know, traditional winemaking is you know you, you you crush the grapes, and the the juice of the grapes you know uh, uh, sits with the skins for a little while, and then it just it just starts bubbling. Um, so I think in wild fermentation, I, I, I slightly overemphasize the role of organisms coming from the air. And, you know, generally the organisms are coming from the food that you are fermenting. If in cases of, of cooked things, then you have to get it from somewhere else. Uh, I visited a, 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 um, a lambic brewery in, in, in Belgium, and what they did is, is after they brewed their beer, they spread it out into this giant tank, like the size of this room that was like six inches deep. So they, they spread it out with a broad surface area in the attic, right under the, these sort of eaves and, 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 and open uh, uh, vents, uh, just so that the, the, the air would just blow over this broad surface and they're getting it from the air. In most, in most cases, people get it from something. Um, um, uh, I did a workshop in Arizona a few months ago with, um, with this guy, Gary Paul Nabhan, and, uh, and he had obtained these ollas, these fermentation vessels that people had been making uh, tejuino, this corn beer in, for a hundred years and they never wash it. They let the crust stay. So that's their vehicle for perpetuation. Um, uh, you know, in, in Scandinavia, the traditional way was like a, a stick. The brewer would have a stick to stir the, 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 the brew with and just never wash it. Just always use the same stick. So, you know, there's lots of different techniques that people in different places have used to sort of, you know, introduce uh, uh, yeast, uh, um, you know, into cooked things. But in raw things, generally, they just come from whatever the food is that you're fermenting. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, um, uh, so miso uh, basically involves making koji. Koji is rice grown with this mold, Aspergillus oryzae. Um, I mean, all across Asia, people use molds like this. Um, Aspergillus oryzae, the Japanese version, is is the one where that where they're really using a single uh, a, a single strain. Um, uh, you know, in China they call it chu, and it's more of a mixed, uh, mixed mold. Uh, and you can go into any kind of uh, a Chinese grocery store and ask for Chinese yeast balls, and you can get you you get these things that are that, that are in Chinese called chu. Um, uh, but anyway, koji. Um, I've always gotten my, uh, my my koji starter from gem cultures, um, uh, and.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're 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 now in Lakewood, Washington. They have they have a, a website, gemcultures.com, um, and they're probably not the only one these days selling code. They're uh, selling Koji starter. If you're going to make miso, you should make your own Koji. It's possible to buy Koji, but. But 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 fresh koji is really much more potent, and also like koji is prohibitively expensive for making you know anything beyond a, a tiny amount. So so koji starter is very cheap. You know for like thirty dollars, I got enough koji starter that I'll be able to use it for the rest of my life. Um, uh, you know basically the process is you um, uh, you know soak your grain. I usually use barley. You could use barley rice, any kind of grain. Soak it, steam it, as opposed to boil it. When you're trying to grow molds on things. Things. You need airspace between things, so it's important to maintain the integrity of the grains. And if you boil them in water, they tend to collapse, so you really need to steam them. I use those like bamboo steamer baskets that you can stack on top of each other. Steam them for a couple hours till they're nice and ni nice and um, pliable. Um, uh, then cool them off to body temperature. Then you introduce a tiny bit of the starter. And then the difficult part is incubation. Incubation is you know maintaining uh, you know m maintaining a warm temperature. The, the, the temperature range for growing koji is 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. You maintain that for, I don't know, somewhere around 36 hours. Um, and then it just begins to smell really beautiful. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, any of these molds, whether you're making tempeh or, or koji, there's this dynamic that for, for the first half of the time, your challenge is keeping it warm, but then, then it begins to generate its own heat. So it's possible it can overheat. So when you make koji, you have to crumble it up a little bit. You have to really sort of keep, keep, keep on it every few hours, um, uh, check on it, make sure it's not overheating, crumble it up. And then, then one, once you have um, a sort of a white coating on all of the um, uh, uh, Grains, it's ready to use. And then meanwhile, you're, you've been soaking your beans, cooking your beans until they're nice and soft. Then you, you know, uh, 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 strain off the extra water, mash up your beans, add your salt, add your koji, pack it all into a, a crock, and wait. There, you know, with the, with the salty, long fermenting misos, the amount you're waiting is a year or several years. Then there are these sweet misos. If you want to try this and have more immediate gratification, it really takes like a week or two for the, for, 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 for the sweet misos. Uh, and there's a lot of different varieties of, of sweet misos. So in a nutshell, that's how you make miso. You do have to find this thing of koji um, uh, or, you know, or, or a, a koji starter to make your own um, a koji. In, in, in the art of fermentation, I have a long section about making koji, a lot of different ideas about how you can, um, how you can incubate it. And by one of, one, of my, one of my incubation ideas, I have to credit Manfred, uh, uh, um, uh, who, who, who taught me how to incubate with, uh, with a plastic tub and an aquarium heater. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of, uh, of, of incubating it, but it's a really fun process. And for anyone who is mildly interested, I would enthusiastically uh, uh, recommend that you do it. And Monfort just told me that there's a that there's a um, uh, uh, there's some people making miso in Oregon, was it? I don't know. Um, but but you know, there, there, there's most of the miso consumed in California is coming from the East Coast. I think that there's a lot of room for. Um, you know, some uh, um, you know enterprising uh, miso maker to to start a, start a great code, uh, uh, miso business uh, here on the West Coast somewhere. Okay, so, so the whole thing about serotonin, I, I can't give you a recipe for, for serotonin. Like this year, they're, they're That's not what I asked. Oh, okay. What I asked was to, to recap on the thought form that you were playing with, and you addressed the concept of the human being and the bacteria as a community, as a whole spectrum community, and then the fermentation part of that, and then it affecting the serotonin in our system and thus the brain and the amygdala. That was extremely brilliant, I perceive. That's my interesting point of view. So if you'd like to recap or expand on that. I think you already have. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, the, 
I, I mean, you know, I mean, I could, I could, I, I could, I could repeat about, you know, fermentation and community. The stuff about serotonin, I don't even know what the amygdala is, so I can't really shed any light on that. But, but the, the serotonin thing, you know, this, uh, where, where I heard it was, was the brilliant NPR show called Radio Lab, and on Radio Lab they had a, they, 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 they had a, um, a show that was called Guts, and one of the segments about guts was these researchers who were working with mice and had demonstrated that, um, that, the, that the serotonin in the mice was related to gut bacteria. Um, basically, by, by raising some mice that were... Uh, 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 oh, what is the word? There's a... a, 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 a I can't remember what the word is. It's a GN word. But, 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 but when they raise an animal in, that's sterile with no gut bacteria, and so they, they sort of demonstrated by having a control group like that how important the gut bacteria were for producing serotonin in the mice. I mean, we haven't really like connected the dots yet to understand how we can do probiotic stimulation of our um, uh, uh, serotonin. My question is, um, is kind of Santa crazy in nature. Um, you know, there's the kombuchas, you know, colors, and then there's the kefir ke 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 and then, you know, but my question really is, what do I need in my belly? You know, like, what, I mean, do I need every, you know, like, to eat, you know, the, I mean, you know, do you need to sauerkraut and kombucha and, you know, like, yes. Your, yes. I mean, uh, that's my short answer. So, okay, let, let me tell you that um, um, m most, of the, most of the research about, you know, probiotics has been about, um, um, you know, specific proprietary strains, right? So, you know, it has to be, for someone to invest in clinical trials, they have to own it. Like, you know, no one's investing in clinical trials for sauerkraut, for instance. Um, you know, because no, nobody owns sauerkraut. Um, so, so, so most of the, and there's a really incredible body of research about these, like, you know, different proprietary probiotics, you know, demonstrating that, you know, better survival in the ICU, fewer absences from school and work. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, every, every, each organ system, you know, there, there, there's been some kind of, um, um, you know, benefit that's been demonstrated. But, but there's a little bit of research about traditional foods, and the, the study that's, that's most fascinating to me was done in Spain, and a group of researchers recruited, um, uh, uh, recruited a group of volunteers who were, who were um, aficionados of fermented foods, people who ate at least five servings a week of varied fermented live culture foods, including um, uh, you know, yogurt, sauerkraut, olives, cheeses, salamis. They really sort of like defined it pretty broadly. Um, and then what they did is they did some blood, some base work, blood, baseline blood work, where they were looking specifically at immune globulin and a couple of other indicators of immune function. Um, and then they put everyone on a deprivation diet, like none of their favorite fermented foods for several weeks. And then after several weeks of, um, of deprivation, they did more blood work and everybody's levels of immune globulin and these other indicators of immune functioning were suppressed, basically, by their lack of bacterial stimulation. Then what they did is they put half the group on traditional yogurt, uh, traditional, you know, uh, 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 you know um, uh, the kind of yogurt we were discussing earlier, and half the group on the new improved probiotic yogurts. I mean, I don't have a TV, so I don't see the ads, but I hear that Activia is all over TV. So it's the, you know, the Spanish equivalent of Activia. Um, and then, and 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 then after a couple of weeks of eating yogurt, they did more blood work, and everyone regained a little bit of their lost functioning. But nobody regained their full functioning until they were allowed to restore their diet of varied fermented foods. So I would say in this case, diversity is its own reward. And yes, you should eat as many different kinds of fermented foods as you can. And beyond that, with a food like sauerkraut, where, which is a successional process, like you actually get different populations flourishing at different stages of its development, like eating it all along its development is better than eating it at any one stage. 
So, so I mean, you know, the lesson that I've taken from this is just like lots of different kinds of fermented foods is better than one. And the other thing, like, you know, to me, the flaw in this probiotic idea is that bacteria are not, um, they're not stable. They're, you know, so the idea of like, of, of saying like, this is the super species that is the, you know, the answer to all of your problems is it, it's just, it's not, it's not stable. It's, you know, they're, they're, they're just, you know, bacteria, they're, they're, their genetics are not enclosed in a nucleus. So whereas, you know, we and animals and plants and even fungi are to some degree genetically fixed. I mean, you know, we, there's this new field called epigenetics. And so, you know, your, 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 your genes are, you know, triggered in a way by environmental and lifestyle factors, but the genes are the same. Bacteria, it's not like that. Like they can just shed bacteria that are no longer necessary in a, in, in a given environment. And to the degree that they're present in their environment, they can take in genes that will enable them to metabolize nutrients or, you know, sort of tolerate some, um, you know, in, in environmental um, 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 uh, uh, compound or, or, or something like that. So, uh, so well, first of all, the cutting edge in microbiology, they're rejecting the notion of species and saying that doesn't apply to bacteria because they're not fixed. Um, that there's one single spe super species of bacteria and then they can just become whatever they need to become get, 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 given the situations. Um, you know, another essay that I wrote, that I read by some microbiologists likened um, likened genes for bacteria to tools for human beings. Okay, so like, you know, I don't have to go through my life, thankfully, with a microphone on all the time. You know, once in a while, when I, you know, get in front of enough people, I have to put one on, and then as soon as I'm done, I take it off, and, and you know, I don't have to carry a jackhammer around with me all the time. Now, one time so far in my life when I needed a jackhammer, I went to this tool rental place, and I rented it, and I broke up the concrete, and it was fun, and then I returned it. So, you know, it's like, it's like we have all this flexibility because we have all these different tools. Um, uh, and, 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 and bacteria are shapeshifters, and they can become whatever they want or whatever they need to be, but, but only based on what's available in their, in their environment. So just taking a capsule with the same bacteria every day it isn't really giving you as much as eating a lot of different kinds of foods that will have you know, slightly different bacterial communities and, and strains. Okay, very back. ties in with that woman's question, but um, I'm interested in the medicinal value of food and you know this whole idea of antibiotics. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about good bacteria and bad bacteria, which I don't really understand. But um, you know something that you know might be going around on college campus is gonorrhea, you know, which is a bacteria. And um, they're saying now in the next year or two that it's morphing so much that they're not going to have proper medications that are going to be able to eradicate it, so it's very epidemic, you know. So I, you know, was thinking you know, about traditional foods and, you know, all these fermented things, and just, you know, your thoughts about tackling these bacteria, you know, um, harmful bacteria with fermented foods. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't really know how to answer that. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I feel like um, you know the the overuse of antibiotics is a huge problem, um, uh, you know, for, for 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 many different reasons. You know, among them that it makes the antibiotic agents that we have less less effective when 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 when, when, we're, when we're overusing them. You know, it makes it, it enables bacteria to quickly develop um, uh, resistance to them. And part of the reason why bacteria are able to develop resistance is this genetic flexibility that they, you know, they, they, they can figure out very, very easily how to, how to become resistant to, resistant to the different chemical uh, agents that, that, that we have. You know, at the same time, I mean, I, I mean, I'll say I'm not opposed to the use of antibiotics, and I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to you if it weren't for the miracle of antibiotics. So, I mean, I, w I would never, you know, uh, uh, you know, counsel people to just like take antibiotics under under no circumstances. Um, I don't think we I don't think we've done enough work to sort of you know know how to use um, uh, you know food 
in that specific way. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, or, or at least like I don't know. Um, so I mean, I think it, 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 I mean it's great. Uh, it, it's a great area for 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 more work and, and research. But um, you know, just as specific antibiotics you know, are only good for so long because uh, the bacteria that they're targeting end up building up resistance. You know, I don't know that specific foods that are probiotic would be able to avoid that, that, that fate. So I, I don't really have a good, I, I don't really have a, have a good answer for you, I'm sorry. Um, oh my God, there's so many, okay, right there. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, the thing about expiration dates on foods is that they have to have one. I mean, you can't sell a food without putting an expiration date on it. So they're very arbitrary what, what they pick. But I would say that a salty, acidified food in your fermentation slowing device at home, in your refrigerator, um, uh, in, a fu in a full jar that is, you know, sort of submerged under liquid should be good indefinitely. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I would say forever if the jar stays full. As your jar empties, there's more airspace in them. Most of the degradation of sauerkraut or any other food has to do with oxidation um, and aerobic organisms that can grow in the presence of oxygen. So if you want to maximize how long your food is going to last in the refrigerator, each time you start getting about halfway empty, consolidate it into a smaller jar where there's no airspace and make sure you keep pressing down to get it submerged under liquid. Um, if you do those things, there's no reason, I mean, there's no reason, you know, if you find a jar of kimchi that you bought five years ago and, and got, got buried in the back of your fridge, there, I mean, there's no reason to think it wouldn't be good. The, the only things that would go wrong would be visible aerobic growths on, on, on the surface. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the ultimate empowering thing is to trust your intuition. And like if you're like if you are making something at home and it just seems really foul and it just seems like and it just seems like something you don't want to eat, like it's OK. You know, it's OK to compost food. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, I, like I don't want to encourage anyone to eat anything that just seems scary to them. <laughs> That said, let me say that most of the time when I have dumped a crock of sauerkraut into the compost, you know, the top looks really ugly, smells really terrible. Then I dump it out, pick it up, and like, oh my God, it looks great at the bottom. Oh my God, it smells great at the bottom. Oh my God, it tastes great at the bottom. So, you know, I mean, generally the things that go wrong are things going wrong at the top. You know, no, I mean, it, no, you're, uh, <laughs> but what, what I mean by that is, you know, <laughs> what I mean by that is that, you know, it's either, it's either from the air, if you're, if you're working in an open vessel, which is what I mostly work in, I mean, the top, you know, the, the part exposed to air can get really, really ugly. Or if you have failed to adequately protect it from flies, if you have maggots crawling around or an accumulation of maggot uh, uh, excrement, that gets really gross. Um, but all that stuff is, for, is stuff that's like at the top and at the bottom. You know, when you when you flip it over at the bottom, it's great. So I would say like, you know, t you know, just 
take out, you know, take out the top third and evaluate. Take out even more. Just, you know, before you throw away the whole thing, just, just, just sort of like, you know, remove it by layers and see, see if it seems any better underneath there. Um, okay, well, first of all, let me say, like, I know I use the expression good bacteria and bad bacteria because I was quoting people asking me questions. I mean, I think it is very inappropriate for us to project our, you know, sort of our uh, uh, sort of judgments. On bacteria are not good or bad. They're, they're, they're just there. And, and I mean, it's interesting, like, there's, there's this one bacteria that, that's being written about, about a lot right now, Hel Hel Helicobacter. Um, uh, and it was, it was viewed as a bad bacteria um, because it had been correlated with stomach ulcers. Um, and, uh, and it is disappearing from, uh, from our stomachs. And now all of a sudden they're thinking, oh, maybe that bacteria had something to do with um, uh, uh, regulating um, energy use and storage. And that, you know, the, the, the obesity epidemic might have something to do with this bacteria um, beginning to go extinct in, um, in, our, uh, in, in our intestines. So, I mean, we, you know, we just we project our human value system on bacteria, you know, kind of at our own peril. So, so, so anyway, there, there's that. The, the idea, the, the, um, the probiotic benefit is not understood at all. Um, like we have, we have only the crudest um, uh, theories about how it works. Um, you know, the idea that like, you know, you eat some sauerkraut and then the sauerkraut bacteria, you know, colonize your intestine, it doesn't really happen like that. Um, because every niche of your intestine has somebody living in it already, um, uh, you know, and so you know it's not like they're you know having a war with the bacteria you just eat, you know the 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 the, the, the model that I have sort of come to have, uh, and you know maybe it's my own model, but it's based on reading lots of the sort of you know uh, um, uh, uh, you know stuff that microbiologists are are, are are writing, and let me also say that I have not taken a biology class since ninth grade, so you know it's not like I'm a microbiologist. Or anything like that, but um, uh, you know, basically because of the gene transfer that, that bacteria are capable of, when we eat live bacterial foods, it increases the um, the uh, genetics available to the bacteria in our gut. So it's not so much that the bacteria are directly competing with one another, it's that they are expanding the range of available genetic material for the bacteria that have taken up residence in our, uh, in our intestines. So, um, so uh, no, I mean, I don't think that, you know, the, the different kinds of bacteria and the different kinds of foods that we eat are, you know, like duking it out, you know, as they, as they pass through our digestive system. Um, you know, I think we're, you know, we're, we're digesting them and, um, you know, some of them survive gastric transit and are, and, and, and are still intact, um, um, uh, you know, bacteria in the intestines and, you know, maybe some of them get to take up residence, but for the most part, they're just interacting with the bacteria in our, in our, uh, uh, in our digestive system already. And in some cases, they are, they, they are transferring genetics to them. Agency that maybe helps 
Well, I mean, I would say like your best resource is some of the people in this room who have started, you know, fermentation businesses right, 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 right here in town. I mean, you know, you're you're in a town where there's, you know, a number of, you know, thriving fermentation businesses and all of them had to go through, you know, approvals processes. You know, I mean, I'll say from having talked to a lot of people who've started fermentation businesses that a lot of people who start these businesses end up having to be educators of their inspectors. So, um, you know, I mean, for, for an inspector who has just sort of um, been, uh, um, uh, you know, educated to believe, okay, so if you work in a restaurant in most of the United States, you have to take these, like, food safety classes, and, and the, you know, central premise is that it's dangerous to eat food that sits out between 40 and 140 degrees for more than four hours. So, I mean, you know, I, I, mean, I don't think that's an unreasonable standard to hold restaurants to in general for, for their food. However, you know, first of all, no fermented food really fits into that because, you know, all of them sit somewhere between 40 and 140 degrees for, you know, much longer than four hours. Um, you know, and if it were so dangerous to eat food that had sat in that temperature range, we wouldn't be here having this conversation because our species never would have gotten anywhere because, you know, it's only in the last, you know, 75 or 100 years that people in the affluent parts of the world have been able to keep their food below 40 degrees. Um, so, but, you know, but, you know, a lot of times the, the health inspectors just, you know, have the dogma and, 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 But they can't do fermented foods. They can't do fermented foods. They could do je jellies and jams and, and zucchini breads and things like that. But e e even though even though sauerkraut, is, I would say, is not a potentially hazardous food, uh, you know, like in that that scheme of things, it is. Well, I just know these laws in all the other states don't don't allow them. Yeah. But the thing is, you know, there's, 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 these products are made all around the world. Um, you know, they, they, they are, they are safe. There are ways to do them safely, and 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 people have been successful at educating their uh, their 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 inspectors. Um, so I don't think that there's like a, um, uh, you know, I don't think any particular like manipulation of the system is required. It's just persistence, a willing to, a, a willingness to find documentation. Um, I, you know, if anyone wants to do any, anything like this in the realm of vegetable fermentation, um, you know, the, 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 this fellow from the USDA has actually been very helpful to a number of businesses in helping their, their local inspectors understand the intrinsic safety of this, uh, of this sort of food. So it's like, it's finding allies, finding documentation, and, 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 and being willing to, 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 to be persistent and, um, uh, and, and, and do the work of, of, of educating the regulators. Um, I'm interested in starting my own uh, non-dairy yogurt, and uh, ideally I'd like to use an edible yogurt starter so I could you know, perpetuate it. Uh, but when I was doing some research online for uh, non-dairy yogurt starters, it seems like a lot of these elements I don't find are just no use or a couple use starters. And so I just wondered if you had any experience with or know of um, I, I do not, but I but I think I, I, there's no reason. I, I can't think of any reason why why it wouldn't work. I mean, I would totally encourage you. I mean, it, I mean, it won't, it's not very expensive. I mean, like for about fifteen dollars, you could buy a you you could buy an heirloom yogurt culture and just experiment with it. Experiment with different you know non dairy substrates and 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 see what it'll grow well in. Um, okay, I've been ignoring this side of the room. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so basically the heirloom yogurt cultures that I got, like I didn't get from my friends in Bulgaria. Um, I, I bought them online, culturesforhealth.com. They sell about 
eight different yogurt cultures from different parts of the world. I'm not exactly sure where they have obtained them from, um, but that, that, that's where I got the ones that I got. Uh, actually, then, and this guy from Maryland just recently sent me a Lebanese yogurt starter. Um, so that's another one that I've been uh, uh, playing with. Um, okay. Well, okay. I, I mean, I would argue that like the Belgian lambic beers are probiotic, um, but because not because of yeast. Yeast is not probiotic. When, when pe- pro- probiotic really, you know, for the most part, applies to lactic acid bacteria uh, among among the the the, 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 the food bacteria. Uh, you know, may, may, maybe some others, but like no, no there's there, there's no you know yeast or molds that I've ever heard anybody suggest are specifically beneficial um, uh, to ingest live. It's it, 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 it's bacteria that, that, that really are the, the beneficial ones. And so in a beer context, bacteria create sour flavors. Traditional alcoholic beverages have always had a sour edge to them and have always been probiotic. Um, but in the context of, um, um, uh, you know, our, our ability to isolate organisms and the sort of um, sort of you know aesthetic direction of a preference for not sour beers, you know, uh, or alcoholic beverages fermented with only yeast and not lactic acid bacteria. Also, they're not probiotic. I mean, we have to we have to accept a little bit of sourness into our palate for our beers to become probiotic. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would say that you know um, you know wild fermented beers that we, you know and you and when you wild ferment anything you'll never get just yeast you always get yeast with lactic acid bacteria um, you know like the, the, those I would argue are probiotic I'm not sure the probiotic industry would accept them as being probiotic um, but 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 I certainly would would argue that they are okay. I mean, I did, yeah, sure, sauerkraut, yeah. They, they call me Sanderkraut for a reason, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, sure, I mean I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't think I, there's been a time since I first made sauerkraut 20 years ago when I didn't have some sauerkraut going. And I don't know that sauerkraut's like my favorite food, you know, compared to stinky cheeses or, or, or you know, other wonderful delicacies, but, but I love sauerkraut. And definitely for people experimenting with fermentation at home for the first time, I think it's just, I mean, that's the gateway. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's simple. You don't need any special equipment. You don't need to obtain special cultures. It's intrinsically safe. Um, you can you can you can enjoy uh, uh, the fruits of your labor relatively quickly. I think that there's just so many uh, so many things to recommend it as a first uh, as a first project. Um, so so that's definitely my you know gateway to fermentation. Sauerkraut or and I say sauerkraut I mean fermented vegetables. You know really it could be any kind of vegetables, any kind of spicing. Um, uh, but 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 yeah like you know chop salt. You know, squeeze or pound, stuff it into a jar, and that's it. Last fall, I was working on a farm, and we had a bunch of cider. Or we had, yeah, we had a bunch of cider, and then we left it in an open, and we always make hard cider with it. Usually we use like a bottler, but this time we just left it in a big open container, which happened to be right next to the bathroom that's like previously used, and it ended up smelling like fingernail polish. Okay. So that's acetone, and acetone acetone is frequently a fermentation uh, a byproduct. Acetone is quite closely related to acetic acid, um, and uh, and and y- you know yes yes that can happen. Um, often it will pass out of that. Like if you let it continue fermenting, you know, um, uh, and you know let, let the process continue, 
uh, uh, you know, often, often it will pass out of that. It had nothing to do with the bathroom. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and, and just as I, you know, what, 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 you know my, my typical, you know, my typical method for, um, uh, you know, making something a card cider is like I'll leave it at the beginning in an open vessel and stir it. If you don't stir it, you'll often get mold growing on the top of it. But if you stir it until it starts to get bubbly, but then once it starts to get bubbly, unless you're just going to let it bubble for a few days and then drink it up as a sort of a, a light cider, I would say you want to move it into a, 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 an airlock. Um, you know, other, otherwise you will, you know, you'll, you'll get, you'll certainly get, uh, you know, uh, uh, vinegar developing and, 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 and potentially acetone. All right. Does everyone here know Catherine Lucas? This is the founder of Farmhouse Culture, one of your, one of your excellent local products. Um, I don't have too much concern about it, really. Uh, I mean, I've been doing it. I, I, mean, I, I mean, really, like, all the fermentation I've done has been in a couple of different kitchens that I've been in, and I've always had multiple things going in, in the same kitchens. The woman I talked about earlier, Betty Steckmeyer, who ran a business for 35 years propagating fermentation cultures, um, you know, she did kefir, kombucha, um, koji, she made all these different cultures in one 12 by 12 uh, 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 kitchen that she had. And she, she claims that she never experienced any specific cross-contamination. The one cross-contamination that I, that I observe is that when I have tried to make, I mean, I talked about this a little bit, uh, my, my efforts to propagate pure culture tempeh uh, uh, starter in the same incubator that I make koji in, and it seems that um, you know the aspergillus really has taken over my my incubator. So when I tried to make koji starter, uh, when I when I tried to make tempeh starter, I always get along with my the, my black spores um, uh, of the Rhizopus oligosporus. I also get um, uh, yellow green spores, which are the aspergillus uh, uh, color. So, but that's really the only uh, that that's the only. Example that that, that 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 I can think of. I mean, I've never. I don't feel like I've ever had, um, uh, you know, my properly airlocked uh, alcoholic beverages. You know, grow a vinegar mother or get excessively vinegary. Um, uh, so it hasn't, it hasn't been. I mean, I think you know. And, and then you know, in terms of contamination, I mean, a lot, a lot of the fermentation literature really emphasizes sterilizing everything. And I mean, I think that. I mean, I just think we really need to get away from that notion. I mean, you know, cleanliness. Yeah, you need to clean things. You know, soap and water and, 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 and rinsing the soap off really well. Um, but, you know, we don't need to ferment in things that have been chemical sterilized or even in things that have been sterilized in, in boiling water. Um, you know, when, when, we're, when we're culturing things, we're adding like enough of what we're adding to, 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 to know that it will, it will take over the environment. When we're doing wild fermentations based on raw ingredients, we're working with the indigenous bacterial populations that are so strong that, you know, I mean, there will be some bacteria in your, uh, in your crock. I mean, if you wash it and then you put it to dry uh, in your drying rack, while it's sitting there drying, bacteria are finding their way to it. I mean, you know, at least at a household scale, like sterility is like something of a myth. I mean, it doesn't really exist and we don't even need to aspire to it. All we need to do is be clean. Well, the communities where uh, communities where information about local local and state laws on food safety mm. and uh, how to educate food inspectors, <coughs> the ins and outs of starting businesses, home cultures, any any kind of communities that are currently swapping that kind of information outside of where we have to be 
Okay, well, okay, let me say that, um, uh, okay, there are, there are culture swaps online, so if you're trying to, if you're trying to, if, if you're trying to, like, find kefir grains or water kefir grains or kombucha mothers, there's, um, you know, at least four different registries that I know of, like, online registries, geographically organized where, you know, you could say, um, you know, I live in, um, uh, you know, Monterey, California, and I have uh, water kefir grains to share. Um, you know, uh, uh, so, th so there's that. Uh, in terms of information sharing communities, my God, um, uh, you know, there's like, there's, there's, there, there's, there's millions, there, there's not millions, but you know, there's, there's lots of them, you know, they're, they're on Facebook, they're on Google, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're all over the, 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 the internet. Um, now, in terms of the specific of like, you know, businesses, you know, sharing their information, I mean, I think, unfortunately, there's a little bit of a, you know, built-in disincentive, you know, but like, like businesses don't want to like, you know, like put all their like um, uh, background business out too publicly. But I have found um, that, you know, a lot of fermentation businesses have been very, very generous with sharing information with people who are trying to start uh, similar kinds of businesses. Um, and I've just heard a lot of, you know, a lot of good stories, including good stories involving people in this room, um, you know, of, of just about, um, uh, you know, established businesses w being willing to, you know, mentor, you know, people trying to start uh, uh, new businesses. And if you can't find someone in your town, maybe it'll be more, you know, easier for someone a little bit further away to share their experiences uh, uh, with you. Uh, also, and I do have in my new book a chapter called Considerations for um, Commercial Enterprises, where I've collected stories. I've never run a food manufacturing business. Do we have time to do like two more? One more back there, I'd say. Yeah, just keep two. Okay, okay, well, we'll definitely do monthly. I have a friend, a coach, who's more to get a Yeah, I have run about contamination. I ran all these cultures against each other. At the medium temperature, Koji Koji wins against the temperate board. Very low temperature, Onshan wins, which is the orange mold. Uh, at high temperature, Napo wins. Anything, yeah. uh, Napo beats everything. Yeah. It's a bacteria. Yeah. So, 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 natto, natto is the Japanese soy ferment that hasn't really caught on in the U.S. Um, and and uh, yeah, I've had exactly the same experience. Like I told you all that when you know the the the, the, the mold ferments start to generate heat halfway through, and so uh, I have had batches where I did try to do 40 pounds of tempeh in my little incubator that's the size of a refrigerator, and then it overheats and kills the tempeh, and then what always happens is it just becomes natto. Um, so, um, so, so basically the story is that Bacillus subtilis, this bacteria that's on all beans and probably on many other types of foods, um, when it's stressed by heat, it, um, it, 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 it sort of creates these spores that can survive up to 240 degrees Fahrenheit. So they survive boiling. And so, you know, they are always present on the beans, even cooked, that you try to do other things with. And it's that, you know, the, 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 the things you're culturing it with, you know, all these organisms have uh, produce what are called inhibitory substances to prevent other kinds of organisms from growing. So as long as the tempeh is, is, is growing, the natto won't grow. But as soon as the tempeh dies from overheating, the natto is right there to, to, to fill the void. Um, so can we, can we go a couple minutes over or do we? Oh, okay, great. One or two more. Okay, great. Back corner there. Yeah. 
I mean, I, the person I have mostly done it with vegetables, mixing, mixing, uh, uh, especially curd mushrooms like shiitakes with uh, with cabbage, and it tastes it tastes really great. But um, but but in Russia, there's a really well-established tradition of just fermenting mushrooms uh, uh, with salt. Um, uh, I have a little section in the art of fermentation um, about uh, about doing that. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't think the, the method necessarily works equally well with every variety of uh, of, of, of mushrooms. Um, uh, but 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 yes, you can ferment them. Okay, right. Okay, so the question is about diseases and fermented foods curing diseases. So I always really say that I, I mostly steer away. I mean, I, I'm personally very skeptical about people claiming that specific foods cure specific diseases. Uh, I mean, people write to me all the time telling me, uh, particularly about digestive problems that they have, um, uh, you know, like chronic digestive problems that they just live with for a long time. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 going away after they eat fermented foods. I've heard miracle cure stories of people's cancers disappearing. My, my favorite story was this, this uh, uh, old Russian woman in Australia told me this story. Her husband had a, a skin cancer in his ear, and he was scheduled for surgery to have this thing removed. And then she had a dream, and her grandmother came to her in her dream and reminded her that when she was a little girl in Russia, Whenever anyone had any kind of skin irregularity, they would pack sauerkraut on it and make a poultice of sauerkraut. So she woke up in the morning and she told her husband about the dream. And he agreed to let her pack sauerkraut poultices on this little uh, skin cancer in his ear. And it, uh, and it started to disappear before the scheduled surgery. And so he canceled the surgery in one way. That said. <laughs> Let me say that I wrote on the back of Wildfire, okay, those of you who don't know, uh, you know, I tested HIV positive in 1991, so for, you know, 22 years I've been, uh, you know, sort of walking around with HIV. And I wrote on the back of Wild Fermentation that fermented foods have been an important part of my appeal. Okay, that's a pretty big statement. So all the time I read things written about me that say that cats cure AIDS with uh, fermented foods. And, you know, let me, let me just be really clear. I take HIV meds every day. I have not cured AIDS. I do not consider fermented foods to be a cure for AIDS or a cure for cancer. You know, if I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, I would not just, like, eat a pound of sauerkraut a day to thinking that that was going to make it go away. Um, I mean, I think that for people with digestive problems, they can have really um, uh, dramatic improvements of, 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 of their digestive limitations by incorporating live culture foods. And I think anybody can improve their health with live culture foods. I mean, I think by you know improving your digestion, your nutrient assimilation, and your overall immune functioning, those are huge benefits to anybody. And you could be like, you know, the healthiest specimen in the world. Um, uh, you know, you could have been diagnosed, you know, last week with a, you know, terrible life-threatening condition. Um, you know, you could have been living for 20 years with some acute, uh, with, with some chronic condition. Um, uh, you know, you could just be feeling the, 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 the you know, the uh, changes from aging. You know, like whatever your health, whatever, whatever your status, like. Your health could potentially be improved by incorporating fermented foods, and it certainly won't be hurt. But but I am very wary of like you know I mean even though people do have miraculous events, miraculous events don't prove anything. Um, you know I mean people write on their websites that kombucha cures diabetes. I think that's a terrible idea. If you have diabetes, I think you should stay away from it. Kombucha. Um, you know, if you want to drink vinegar, that's great. But kombucha is partially metabolized. You know, it's sweet, it's sugary. If you have diabetes, you don't want to eat sugary things. So, so anyway, I mean, I'm just really skeptical about like you know claiming any particular uh, um, uh, uh, disease cure. So that was a long-winded answer. 
Um, we give Farmer Liz in the back had your hand up. Okay, could be Liz. last question. And then I, I apologize to you. See if this is what happens every time. Is like as soon as people get going, yeah. everyone there's more questions and more yeah. questions. And I love that, and I really wish we could stay here all night and do that. Before you go, Liz, before you go, I want to say Tim's going to be over there signing books um, and can ask, answer maybe a few questions while that's happening. Um, also, we still got the. For a minute, over there on the side for people to eat, and I want to encourage who has the sign up sheet? Two sign up sheets for the common ground. Oh, no. You got one? And you got one. Great. They're going to be over there on the side to help me. Um, please do sign up. we are doing this all the time. And the last question Barbara lived from a farm around campus. All right. Did you stand up? So I thank you all. I wish we could stay here.